Hello and welcome to a special podcast from the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. I'm Dr Kelvin Kong, an otolaryngology head neck surgeon or ear, nose and throat surgeon. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking about the pathway of becoming a surgeon, sharing some advice, experiences and stories from someone who's applying at the moment. Today, I have a special guest, Dr Justin Kane. Justin is an aspiring surgical trainee, currently working in vascular and acute general surgery. To begin, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways across the country and elders past and present. Welcome, Justin. So it's mm -hmm. after 8 p.m. on a weeknight, and we've decided to have this conversation. Tell us about your day today. Well, look, it's a, it's a sort of standard surgical registrar operating day today. So big day, got up early. Came in, did a ward round, and then all day operating list with a few emergencies coming in. So uh, taking a bit more, bit bit more time than what I originally planned for today. What time did your day start today? Then? Um, so I started around six thirty today. Yep, and seeing patients before you start your other work. Yep. And do you enjoy this work? Yeah, I do. I do. Like I think it's tough, but deep down, um, I actually really enjoy what I'm doing. Really love it. Before I dive more into that, tell us a bit about your mob. Who are you? I'm a Waddy Waddy and Ewan man from South Coast of New South Wales, from a little community called Wreck Bay, um, on my dad's side. My beautiful, mum's... Beautiful surf. Beautiful surf. Aussie pipe. Um, best surf in Australia. Um, whiter sand in the world. Uh, so yeah, very proud. And then um, my mum's family's from a little town called Moree in northwest New South Wales, so that makes me a Gamilaroi man as well. And so what inspired you to want to go down this pathway of surgery to move away from beautiful country like that? Mm. Look, there's a few different things. I, I guess um, my family were always very hard workers, and so I feel like they instilled in me a very strong work ethic. And um, they're also um, community-oriented people as well. So um, providing some form of community service was something that I always wanted to do. And um, just myself personally, I feel like I am someone who needs to challenge myself um, and needs to always be challenged. And I think after thinking about it for a while, I felt like medicine would be a good, a good uh, career to do that. And so you get through medical school, which, you know, it must have been hard going through medical school um, alone. You finally get this uh, DR in front of your name. Um, you're earning good money. You're working hard. Why punish yourself more? <laughs> that's, that, <laughs> that, that's really funny when you put it that way. But, um, you know, I guess for me, that community service that I was just talking about, I think it's a, a deep, um, sense of giving back to the communities that I work in and, and live in. Uh, I think people, um, need doctors who, um, and we all are, um, I feel like all of us are very committed to providing the best possible services to our patients and making sure that that's visible to the patients to know that, that they can be reassured when they come in um, to be cared for because when patients come and see us, they're usually at a very vulnerable sort of moment in their lives and I feel a sense of pride when you can come and reassure someone that something's going to be okay and that um, you do have a treatment option for this and so on and so forth. So I think um, that deep sense of... Deep sense of um, pride in work and, and community services, very strong. It's really warming mm. to hear that. I, I want to pick up on um, when what happens when you um, finish medicine. So you're working hard. And there's a lot yeah. of people out there, who, both who are mm. part of our fellowship, yeah. but also people who aren't involved in uh, specialist colleges mm. who aren't really uh, aware of that pathway into doing surgery. It's not mm. like you tick a box and say, I'm going to be a surgeon. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about exactly what's involved mm. 
and getting to the stage of yeah. just applying for surgery. So mm. we're not even saying you're getting on the surgery, just just mm. to apply for surgery. What kind of things yeah. you need to do? Well, as as an intern and a resident, there are lots of sort of steps involved just in those two years. So you need to make sure that you um, the appropriate do the appropriate surgical rotations um, as a junior doctor so that you get some exposure to um, the sur- different surgical fields and particularly the field that you have some interest in and undertaking other terms in things like critical care and ICU. I think that's also very important um, and something that a lot of the, uh, well, particularly um, for my specialty that I'm working in now, um, you have to have an ICU um, term um, as minimum requirement. And then also you have to, in that time, while you're working a full-time clinical load, you also have to study for the GSSE, um, which, which is, is the surgical sur- exam. Yeah, sur- yeah. which is the um, surgical exam, which is also minimum eligibility, uh, a minimum eligibility requirement as well. Anything else that's involved in that? Um, I think it's also what with studying for. Yeah, like do yeah. you have to do research or papers or things yeah. like that, or is that not really required? Um, no, it, it is important. So in, in those early phases, you should start to think about um, finding a consultant that you're working with who's active in research and... By consultant, uh, you mean boss? Uh, yeah, yep. a boss um, a boss or a fellow, someone senior who's might be undertaking a higher degree research themselves, like a PhD or something. And there, there are always sort of someone um, looking for looking for an extra set of hands to help collect some data or search the literature, um, things like that. So even those little tasks can get you involved in the research process and, and on and name onto a paper and that then goes towards your C V. And you have done some research as well. You've recently uh, done another degree, I hear. Yeah, so I just finished a masters of surgery, um, and majored in uh, vascular surgery. And so get let me get this right. You not only have to spend a lot of time working, I assume, very long hours as a junior doctor, mm-hmm. which are often, what, nine, ten hour days? Yeah. No, maybe less. Yeah. Um, you're also doing courses. Mm-hmm. You're doing research, which yep. is unpaid work. Yeah. You are also sitting your exams mm-hmm. to sit this primary. Yeah. Tell me a bit about sitting that first exam. Is it is it a tough exam? Is it an easy exam? Do you have to study mm. much? Is it how do you compare it to medical yeah. school, for example? I definitely think that it's it's harder than medical school for a number of reasons. And the the main one I think is you are working a full time clinical workload and so you have to find time to study for that exam or revise for that exam. And so that's difficult is the time management component. I I feel that if you had the time, you'd be able to easily um, revise the information because it's a lot of content that we have covered at some stage, either from our medical degrees or from other study, like like a master's program where you do major in anatomy. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it is a hard exam and you need to dedicate time to preparing for it. And so for me personally, I, I made sure that I dedicated at least three to six months preparing for, for that exam. It's a lot of, it sounds like a lot of sacrifice. <laughs> How do you find out all this information and things you need to do? So look, the way I originally found out, I first heard from a few of the registrars that I worked with or did placements with as a medical student, as a senior medical student. And then um, once I became a junior doctor, I started um, looking into the College of Surgeons website and the minimum requirements and the specific info around the GSSE um, exam and the syllabus and uh, the recommended resources that the college provides. Was it easy to find that information? Um, I think so. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's very easy to find that on, on I want to I want to pick up on what you said, though. You, mm-hmm. you mentioned you had some good registrars ahead of you. Yeah. So by registrars, they're the senior trainees who are actually heading down a, a, a specialist program. Um, you mentioned you chatted them. How important mm-hmm. is it to get good registrars to give you the right advice, or um, does that really matter at all when all the information's on the college website? Um, I, I think that it 
it matters a lot. I think it makes a huge difference um, if you have uh, good senior registrars who um, are committed mentors and who sort of embody the the college sort of principles of mentoring and teaching and uh, and education. So uh, a lot of registrars share things that you that might not be covered in the syllabus. So telling you about what they did and the time commitment that they put in and recommending time that you should, um, the amount of time you should dedicate towards study and research and other things as well. Similarly then, is it important to have a good consultants or bosses to give you that kind of advice? Yes, I think so as well. Um, I think the consultants and bosses, I think they provide really good sort of big picture sort of advice, um, big picture sort of planning. So they're helpful with planning your career, but the little, the sort of smaller steps to get to that stage, um, the accredited trainees and the senior registrars provide quite a lot of insight. What about the hospital you're at? Does it matter what hospital you're at? You know, people mm. worry about having to go to the big tertiary centers. Is mm. there other regional places you can do yeah. things or? So during my time, I've done some, done a rural secondment and, you know, in that time it was, um, very hands-on. So you get a lot of clinical experience, but also I found that, uh, a lot of the bosses in the rural areas were also committed to teaching and um, education and mentoring as well. So um, particularly for junior doctors or registrars who are committed to working in a rural area as well. That's not to say that people in the tertiary centres aren't, um, but I feel like um, I feel like the rural, like rural component is important. Um, I think that there are a lot of different centres that um, have that are very research active. And so making sure that you um, go to a place that um, has uh, good research output or, or, or some form of, of research is important. Um, a couple of hard yeah. questions then for you. <clears throat> yeah. Would you rather an amazing registrar, an mm. amazing consultant or an amazing hospital? Super hard question. Super hard question. He's answering with a big smile on his face. <laughs> I think that... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You don't have I to think, answer that. I know. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that because I feel like I'd get into trouble. That's also yeah. important. How important is a good cutting job when we talk about having a good yeah. cutting job? By that we mean a hospital or a job that you're doing where you do get some operating experience. Mm. I, I think that's important, but I think it's important at a different stage. So a little bit, a little bit further down the further, line. Further, more training. Are yeah. you serious? A little bit. It can be. It can be. It can be a little bit longer than than required. It is. It is quite competitive to become a surgeon, and so there's qu often quite a lot of people um, in the hospital that you're working with um, who you're working with on a day to day basis. But also in terms of applying to the college, they're essentially competition as well. What's the coolest operation you've you've seen? Uh, I think. Seen or been involved with? I've been involved, uh, I think, heart and lung transplantation. Yeah, I think wow. that's, I think that's What incredible. does that involve? Um, well, obviously you, there's a process involved in retrieving um, organs from someone who um, has, de who is deceased and um, who has um, become a donor. And that process of retrieving organs is um is very humbling because a family or, or an individual has decided to donate obviously their parts of their body to help another human being out. And when, and then there's a process of traveling to retrieve, um, to retrieve the organs and then, and then coming back to implant the organs. So, and in that time, making sure that the timing of the travel um, is synchronized to the implantation. So there's usually two separate teams involved, a um, lot of communication and yeah, very it must long be very, operating. <laughs> it must be very draining as well as, well as very rewarding, I assume. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, it can lead to really long days, but 
um, when you have good outcomes and you see patients um, tell you about how their breathing has improved overnight because they've got a new set of lungs. It's in incredible. Do you remember the first operation you did? Yes. Yeah, I do. Tell us about it. <laughs> it was quite funny. It was, I was a medical <laughs> student. Yeah. Um, I was a first year medical student in a very small hospital and um, I got to do a couple of um, skin excision, skin lesion excisions with um, a general surgeon. And, um, you know, I'll never forget it that day. I um, That was the day that sort of hooked me onto surgery. And I'll, yeah, never That'd forget so it. Cool. Learn, learning how to gown and learning how to scrub. And then, yeah, a couple of very, um, very minor procedures, but it was enough to get me hooked. What was the first operation you did alone? And how did it feel being the person responsible yeah. for this patient? First operation I did alone was a um, was a toe amputation, and it was in a patient who was quite unwell because of their toe being infected. And so, ensuring that first of all, it was it was very scary because you look around to see if there's anyone else um, senior sort of in the room to help you out because you're usually you're usually there with someone senior and someone is usually guiding you but on this particular occasion um it was it was an on call evening i had to come in um see this patient and it it's very lucky you you're then having to work in a team with an anesthetist and communicate with with them and with the scrub nurses and i think being involved in a team, being a leader in a team, um, and then also being the most senior surgeon in the room was was very scary. But also, um, I was very humbled as well because I think about I think about where I come from to to then being in the operating theatre and and doing performing an operation was. It must be a buzz for you. Yeah, it to was. Be able it was. That. It was really cool. Yeah, it was a big buzz, and you know, we ended to up getting the patient. yeah to help the patient and we ended up getting a really good outcome and like a couple of days later, the patient felt a lot better and, and then got them to a stage where wound completely healed and is eventually walking fine. I want to pick up on, if I may, the point you said there that, you know, where you've come from to be mm. able to be in this leadership position of helping from mm. a surgical point of view. What's the reaction of Aboriginal patients um, when they meet you and, and appreciate or realise that, mm. that you're an Aboriginal man? I, he's got a big smile. I know I've got a huge pod, smile. Uh, it makes me happy every time. Um, every time I interact with an Aboriginal patient, because um, the just the the pride that I see in um, Aboriginal people's patients' faces when they see me walk up with often with my like Aboriginal design scrub cap. Um, and they can clearly tell, like, I'm an Aboriginal man and instantly like our communication and is on an, a completely different level and is on such a special cultural level. But then also I know that the therapeutic relationship that I'll have with that patient is going to be, um, even more special and that I feel like outcomes will be a lot better because, um, because I'm able to communicate in a way that the patient will understand and will um, appreciate and also really, um, really sort of work towards because they're hearing it from another Aboriginal person. That's so special to hear. On yeah. the flip side of that then, how do you manage community and family expectations? It must be quite burdensome for this pressure to be successful when you've already done so many great things. Yeah, it is. It is. It's particularly hard. Um, the big thing that I'm finding at the moment is I've, I've been working um, away from my home communities. And so I feel like that's a bit of the sacrifice that I'm making now in order to train to become a surgeon. Um, and so I feel like there could be, there's more I could be doing for my home communities. Um, but because we don't have vascular services nearby, it's quite hard to train in those sort of regions. So I have to train, train away, but then also reassuring my community that at some stage in the future, I would like to come back and provide a vascular service to, to them. 
in saying that, then where do you see yourself in, say, 10 years' time? Uh, well, 10 years' time, um, I'd like to be coming towards the end of, of, um, of surgical training, hopefully a fellow by then, and um, have enough experience working in, uh, ha- having gained a lot of experience working in metropolitan centres that I can then take back to a re- regional or rural setting. If you saw Justin Kane as mm. a medical student or a young uh, surgeon uh, intern coming up to you, mm. what advice would you give, give them about um, this processing in attaining surgical training? I would tell junior doctor Justin to perhaps, uh, to always keep planning. Like I think it's always important to have a plan um, and to manage time um, and to prepare because when you prepare, you are always going to get a good outcome, I feel. But I would also tell them not to, not to maybe take things too seriously. <laughs> um, so making sure you balance your life, your life as well. Like it's not, it's not all encompassing to just focus on studying for one exam. Um, you have to balance it with other things, but yeah, mainly having a plan, being prepared and managing time well, and also just to continue learning and, um, taking on board the feedback and the wisdom from the people that you work with, I think is also important. That's really good advice. And I want to thank, uh, Justin for joining me tonight. Um, It's been a very enlightening conversation and always a pleasure chatting to you and I wish you all the most success and hopefully our listeners uh, can gain a little bit of wisdom from this. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Kelvin. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To learn more about the RAC's Indigenous Surgical Pathway Program, visit surgeons.org and follow the links to the Indigenous Health page. The Indigenous Surgical Pathway Program is funded by the Federal Department of Health through Specialist Training Program. This podcast has been produced in collaboration with Aboriginal Media, Communications and Events Company, 33 Creative. Music composed by Makasha Marcella.